Jesus. begin with the prayer divine mother heavenly father friend beloved god great saints guru preceptors of all ages and all religions we humbly bow to you all thank you for raising our vibration thank you for blessing this class om shanti So who will tell me where we are? Two forty-three, I think. Page two forty-three. I think we finished two forty-three. Oh, is it to prepare the mind for so vast an expansion? Yes, that's yes. right. Okay. So we were uh, reading the explanation for this uh, sloka, which is five twenty-seven and twenty-eight. The Muni, one for whom liberation is the sole purpose of life. Controls his senses, mind, and intellect, removing himself from contact with them by neutralizing the currents of prana and apana in the spine, which manifest outwardly as inhalation and exhalation in the nostrils. He fixes his gaze in the forehead at a point midway between the two eyebrows, thereby converting the dual current of physical vision. Into the single omniscient spiritual eye, such a one attains complete emancipation. So Krishna is explaining to uh, Arjuna the qualities of a yogi, and he is telling Arjuna that, "Oh Arjuna, be thou a yogi." 
So basically, he is saying how, what is the yogic method of raising the energy in the astral body, in the spine, so as to open the spiritual eye, right? Once the spiritual eye or the third eye is open, that is when we understand higher truths. That is when our intuition is open. That is when we can download, you know, messages from the masters, as it were. So once the two, the dual vision is changed into the single omniscient spiritual eye, such a one attains complete emancipation. So I was mentioning in the last class also that Jesus says, when thine eye be single, thy whole body will be full of light. So he was the Bible says exactly the same thing that when your eye is single, when you are no longer looking at the physical reality with the physical eyes, when you are able to go behind the physical reality into the energetic reality and open your energy eyes, as it were, that is the third eye, that is when you will gain freedom. That is when the veils of Maya will fall off and you will be able to connect directly to source. So to go on with the explanation, to prepare the mind for so vast an expansion, that is the, uh, the liberating shock of omnipresence, as Master says, to prepare the mind for so vast an expansion, however, one cannot simply keep an open mind and go along for the ride. Only a spiritual hero can attempt the journey even with the help of the Guru who has made it already. The courage required is not the daredevil type which declares why preening itself, just watch me. Of course, I can do it. It is of a different type altogether, seeming to require at first perhaps a very feminine kind of surrender which says, I trust you to do it right. Instead, however, there is nothing of either the feminine or the masculine in this great leap of faith. So what Swamiji is saying in his explanation is that the spiritual path is actually a double-edged, it's a double-edged sword. You, the spiritual path as opposed to the religious path, in the religious path, you have pundits who will give you do's and don'ts, who will tell you, you follow this and you will be safe. You do this and you will get this. The spiritual path is for people who want to go inwards and who want to discover the divine in themselves, who are on the path of self-realization. So in that sense, people who are interested in spirituality are taking full responsibility for their actions. I cannot next blame the pandit and say, you know, you told me to do this. So now you get me out of it. No, we are at every moment, we are making choices and we are prepared to take the consequence of those choices. So it requires a very, very different kind of courage. As Swamiji is saying, you are basically on your own. The Guru is there, but the Guru is not going to do your work for you. He will be there as a guiding principle. But ultimately, you are supposed to take your own responsibility. There is no God out there also. A God who will save me. God is within me. I am going to connect with my source energy to the vastness of source, which is beyond the 3D dimension, right? All of us have source already inside. So it is a path which is quite, quite difficult. It is certainly not for the faint hearted. 
there is nobody now you can turn and say you told me this now you get me out of it you have to take a responsibility for the consequences so swami ji is saying more than a uh, you know a spiritual hero more than i can do it and i will go out and do it it is a kind of a surrender what does you know people who can surrender have less ego they are able to let go and say that there is a universal current of energy which is flowing through the this dimension as well and i am able to connect to that and i am able to trust that it is benevolent and i am able to surrender so it is not the little ego which is speaking here it is the part of us which there is a knowing that i am a part of source so that kind of surrender and being able to trust that no matter what i am going through it is because um, it is because i am going through a certain lesson and i have to learn through that experience how to become a higher version of myself so that kind of surrender is required which means on the spiritual path gradually as we progress we are letting go of the ego bit by bit we are understanding that we are not this little body and we are not this separate self but we are connected to the source we are part of everything that is just that vastness in even to understand that thing conceptually takes an expansion of our own consciousness and some people cannot take it so after a while you know they will say that i was quite good you know by my own self living my little selfish life this is too much for me right so the spiritual path is certainly not for the faint hearted okay so swami ji says this kind of courage there is nothing of either the feminine or the masculine in this great leap of faith the heroism required is the courage implied in the words of a chant by yogananda paraphrased here i will drown myself in the infinite to find my true self to be infinite so the courage to drown oneself in the infinite with the complete trust that i will be taken care of that kind of faith only when we have we <coughs> we can realize that we ourselves are part of the infinite that is the meaning of self realization s as in capital is realizing our own higher nature realizing that we have all the god like qualities and once we have removed layer after layer what are those layers the layers are the mask self the beautiful face we put for society that is a layer we have to remove then there is the ego self which we have to remove then there is the shadow self the part the dark part of us which we don't like to acknowledge we may not know we possess but just by being part of duality all of us have darkness and light within us so to remove to understand the shadow self to transmute the shadow self finally to go beyond that to the gender the male female we are all souls we have taken on a certain body and a certain gender 
because of the lessons that we need to learn as a soul, right? So if my uh, life lesson that I need to learn and overcome is that I have to stand up for myself, I will 100% be born in a very, very oppressive male chauvinistic family. And it is in rising above that and standing for what, who I am, being able to speak up, that is where my spiritual growth will be. And so I will choose the worst situation which will trigger that in me. In one life, I can choose not to learn it. And I can choose, you know, to become suppressed and I, cho I can choose to become uh, abused and used and then die feeling like a victim. Or I can choose to stand up and I can choose to say no. So we choose the family, we choose the circumstance, we choose the gender according to the lesson that we have come to learn. So maybe I need to learn how to have courage. Now I will be born as a man who will willy-nilly be in the army and there will be three wars in my lifetime. And I'm dying of fright in overcoming that fear, which is why I have taken a male body, right? So often, you know, many people ask me that why are all the gurus in this line men? And in fact, why are most gurus men? So I said, if you look at society, even today in the 21st century, it is still a patriarchal society, right? It's shifting, mass consciousness is shifting. So these souls who are coming on earth and whose mission is to shift mass consciousness they don't want to come with a body which will put an additional hurdle. It's a hard path by itself by coming as a woman. So in this day and age, they have consciously chosen male bodies. They themselves are genderless in their consciousness. They are just souls. But they choose a certain body because that is what will help me to learn my lesson or to do the task that I have come to do. So Swamiji says, this spiritual courage is neither masculine nor feminine. It is a courage which, you know, can leap into the unknown. So that kind of faith, it's a great leap of faith. Even in our Kriya Yoga, when we are meditating, the body has the path. When we are doing the Kriya breath, when we are doing the meditative practice, we are focusing here. We don't go up to here. Only when we are ready and the third eye is open, that is when automatically the crown chakra will open. That is the leap of faith which in the physical body, all of it, otherwise we have all the physical equipment to realize our God self. But the ultimate Sahasrara, the thousand petal lotus will only open once we have opened this automatically because then there is that complete faith, that leap into the abyss or to the unknown. Umi, I have a question. Yeah. There are many women yogis, then why do they choose that gender? If so that they, they will not take a world role. They will do their own thing. You will see today how many yogi, women yogi leaders you will see. They have possibly, they will take the role if you study their lives. Maybe uh, they will not go out and teach, you know, millions of followers, but they are doing their own spiritual growth work. And for that, they might well be oppressed. If you see Mirabai and all that, so people will drag them and poison them and kill them and do whatever. So that is their lesson that it is so difficult 
so they come in that but if you are going to be a world leader in this kind of scenario as of now the yogis uh, the masters have always taken male bodies to make their task easier the women yogis are people who are doing their own development so they don't come out i'm not saying this is how it's going to be maybe we will still be alive when there are very great already you do see women saints who hold satsangs like ananda mai ma and all they had their disciples but they will very carefully choose like where i will be born what kind of disciples i have i will have and depending on that the soul chooses the body to inhabit uh now talking about the ananda mai ma you know she is not in this lineage right no. uh, but the picture which normally we see you know it in this in this picture you also have it there in your uh, meditation room that all the masters are sitting along with ananda mai ma why i know she seems to have some kind of soul connection with uh, you know this line Okay. somewhere because yogananda used to visit her and all that mm. she is always there okay so it needs a great leap of faith so the heroism required is the courage implied in the words of the chant of yogananda i will drown myself in the infinite to find my true self to be infinite only when i take that leap of faith and i can jump into that will i realize that i am also god to realize my true self to be the infinite true faith it must be understood is very different from blind belief belief is when okay you have told me i trust you so okay i believe true faith actually comes from experience on the spiritual path we are often given experiences of god when we are meditating also so many it is then when you actually experience it for yourself that faith becomes unshakable okay true faith it must be understood is very different from blind belief the artist who paints a line on an almost completed work of art knowing that the line will either make or hopelessly mar his work must know what he is doing his knowledge must be intuitive not intellectual this kind of work isn't something that could be done by a committee though the artist knows his only way of showing his knowledge is by doing it that is the meaning of faith a sure a sure intuition and an inner complete certainty which no amount of reasoning could either support or demolish so when your intuitive powers are open there is an inner knowing just like an artist knows exactly which stroke to give now an artist actually follows their intuition they are not going step by step it is not a logical process at all when you are painting okay so a sure intuition and an inner complete certainty which no amount of reasoning could either support or demolish you somehow know the sense of knowing comes especially when you start practicing meditation in a deep way or even without it some people already have that knowing maybe from past lives what these two stanzas of the gita teach is the importance of self preparation for that supreme act of faith which is where yoga enters the picture so in order to you know take that leap of faith we must have a lot of preparation and that is yoga yoga is the scientific way of connecting to our own god self right so yoga gives you the tools the how to the what we already know what about what is the how that is what yoga brings 
To concentrate one's gaze at the point midway between the eyebrows is not so strange a practice as it may seem at first. Whenever one is inspired by a new insight or idea, he lifts his gaze upward as if instinctively. The seat of superconsciousness is in the forehead. So in meditation, what are we doing in Kriya Yoga? We are taught how to focus on the spiritual eye and bring the energy to the spiritual eye. So this is the seat of superconsciousness. What does superconsciousness mean? It means going beyond the intellect into intuition. The intellect is limited. It is of the physical body. When we learn to open the intuition, that sense of knowing, that is when we touch the superconscious. The frontal lobe, sorry, the seat of superconsciousness is in the forehead. That of the subconscious is at the back of the head. So this is the positive pole of the Ajna Chakra or the third eye. This is the negative pole, the medulla, the hollow at the back of where the skull joins the neck, right? So the medulla is the negative pole of the Ajna Chakra or the third eye. This negative pole is the seat of the ego. It is the primitive brain where all our fears are jammed. This is the animal brain, right? So <clears throat> this is where all the subconscious stuff is stored. And this is where the frontal lobe is the seat of reason. This is where superconsciousness is there. So the two poles of the third eye, the positive pole is the seat of superconsciousness. The negative pole is the seat of subconscious. The frontal lobe of the brain, which is located just behind the forehead, is the advanced portion added by human evolution to the brain itself. The foreheads of lower animals slant sharply back, indicating the absence of a frontal lobe. So animals don't have a forehead, right? Especially lower animals, they, their foreheads are slanting. They only have the fear energy, the instinctual energy. Yogis in ancient times discovered that the part of the frontal lobe that needs to be particularly stimulated is the portion just behind the point midway between the eyebrows, exactly where we focus in meditation. So, yogis discovered that if we focus all our energy here, that is where we will go beyond the physical body into the astral body or the causal body or the, and attain superconsciousness. We saw earlier in these pages that the physical act of breathing is intimately associated with and is indeed caused by the energy rising and descending in the spine through the Ida and Pingala Nadis or nerve channels. Ida begins on the left side, Pingala on the right. Actually here, I do believe if you, uh, there might be a typo error here, you know. So I was talking of the three channels, the Shushumna, the Ida and the Pingala. The Ida is the receptive channel. These are all energy channels. We cannot see them. They are on the energy body. <coughs> so the Ida channel begins in your, it is, it is the introverted, receptive lunar nadi. It is governed by the moon, the feminine side. So that governs the intuitive, creative brain, the right brain. So the Ida Nadi begins at the right brain and then moves this way. It controls the left side of the body. The Pingala Nadi begins in the left brain, which is the seat of logic and reason, and but it controls the right side of the body. And the Shushumna is in the middle. 
So the breathing that happens in the astral body or the energy body takes place in the Ida and the Pingala. The breath in the astral body is in the spine and is composed of energy, not of inhalation and exhalation by the lungs. So yogis are not interested in the physical body. They are going into the energy body. What are we being taught in meditation, in the energization exercises? How to have control on our energy body. We are not so interested in the physical body. You want to do stuff for the physical body, you can go to the gym, you can run, you can do all kinds of physical exercises. Even Hatha Yoga is good. But meditators are interested in the astral body or the energy body. And what are we learning? We are learning how to channel energy, how to control our prana or the energy in the body. So the ascending energy is called prana, the descending apana. So when we are meditating, we first start with focusing on the breath. After a while, what do I say? As the breath slows down, go behind the breath and sense the energy movement in the spine. We are trying to understand the energy movement in the astral spine, not the physical spine. So with the inhalation, the energy movement which is going up is called prana. With the exhalation, the energy movement is called apana. So the prana and the apana is what the yogi is focused on. So one yoga technique involves alternately, alternately closing the right and left nostrils. So we have the alom bilom in, in yoga practice. Alternately, we are stimulating yes. the ida and the pingala, right? So... But Swamiji is saying, you know, if you do that, your focus goes too much on the physical thing. Now I have to close this nostril. I am going to breathe deep. Then I'm going to do this. So all that really distracts. So the meditative practice is to sit still. No physical movement at all. We are simply following the energy moving in the body. <laughs> So to control those currents with the attention focused on the outward activity of closing and opening the nostrils directs one's attention more to the breathing aspect of the exercise than to the energy flow in the spine. Kriya Yoga is the science that was particularly recommended by my own guru and by his line of gurus. Kriya Yoga was first given in modern times by the great Himalayan master, simply known as Babaji or revered father. According to my understanding, Babaji is, is himself an incarnation of the great Indian master of ancient times, Narayana, who more recently was Lord Krishna himself. So Babaji is an incarnation of Lord Krishna. Babaji told his disciple Lahiri Mahashaya, whom he initiated into Kriya Yoga in 1860, that Kriya is the supreme ancient science of yoga and that he himself in a previous body, of course, as Krishna to Arjuna, he himself in a previous body had given it to the world. This science may be called God's greatest gift to humanity for the soul's salvation. So Kriya Yoga is the ancient, very, very effective scientific technique, if you want proof and all that, of moving towards our higher, highest nature or self-realization. Kriya Yoga helps one, as we discussed earlier in this book, to equalize the incoming and outgoing breaths and to absorb one's energy in the spine where one feels the current as a cool rising and a slightly warm descending current. <clears throat> there is another simple technique helpful to practice as a preliminary exercise. With mental detachment, watch the breath flowing naturally in the nostrils. A mantra should be uttered with the breathing process. 
Hong as the breath flows in, allowing the flow to occur naturally and saw as it flows out. So he is actually, the Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita has already described the process of meditation that we are learning right now. The Hong Saw meditation up and down, right? When can you realize that, you know, the, the breath or the energy is flowing up your astral spine or the shushumna? There is a way to understand your progress on the meditation path. Notice whether your breathing is equal in both nostrils. Most of the time, some part of the day, we are breathing through the left nostril. Some part of the day, we are breathing through the right nostril. Rarely will we equally breathe through both nostrils. What does that mean? The two hemispheres of my brain are perfectly balanced. The right and left hemispheres. And it means that now the energy can move up the shushumna. And that is when the kundalini starts to rise. So if you will notice, we don't breathe with both nostrils at the same rate. Either at some point... Uh, Urmi, if I can just interrupt you, sorry. How no. do I know whether I'm breathing more through my left or my right? Just understand, I can make out I am breathing through my right nostril. Just, just <laughs> pay attention. Even I can make out. I can make out that I just, you can place your finger below your nose. You will see where you are breathing from. Usually when we are doing very, see, I am talking, I am putting out energy. So my right nostril will be active. If I was meditating and I was quiet and I was receptive, then my left nostril would take up the breathing. Start noticing it. Yogis have perfected the art where they are all the time breathing equally from both nostrils. When that kind of balance is attained, that means the energy, the kundalini is rising up the central channel or shushumna. Okay, did you make out, Jamuna? Ah, no, 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 I can't, I can't make out. Make out, yeah, notice it. These things are interesting to notice. Just place your finger here, you'll know which nostril you're breathing from. Or you can just, uh, you know, like what I do because I'm perennially breathing from only one nostril. Which uh, one? Uh, no, it, it depends. Like my nose gets clogged. So nah, either or. This. With yeah, everybody. So you, that's what I'm telling you. You shut this and you'll see you'll have difficulty breathing through this. Yeah. That <laughs> that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Nah. It's easy to spot which nostril you're breathing from. So once we... Okay, we right, are, I, Right, yeah. yeah, that's a good way, Shampa. That works. <laughs> right nostril. So what does right mean then? It's the pingala nadi which is active, which means you are in the active mode. Right? The, the masculine energy is operating in you, not in gender, but you know, in the in the sense that more outward. Mm. If the left nostril is working, then it is your feminine energies are more powerful and you are more receptive you are an introvert you do stuff on your own at home or wherever by yourself and people who are involved in the world you know the pingala uh, breathes more often so the point is we keep uh, we always hear now balance the masculine and the feminine in you if you are always out there, learn to be, learn to receive. We keep saying, right, in therapy, to give and to receive. You need to understand how to do both. Most so of us are giving out uh, there. Sorry? Yeah, my nostrils are open now. So I'm breathing from both uh, and I'm together. Uh, together. So how can I make out that which one I'm breathing more? I don't know. That's what Shampa was saying. I can make out. Just pay attention. You'll be able to understand. 
do this. Put your and close see, your one nostril. Just do this and breathe. You will know which one is. Like active. for example, my right nostril is completely blocked. I can't breathe only. So I try to breathe only from my right nostril. Nah. My both are open. You know. So mm. when you're breathing evenly. Then you are in a balanced state right now. Oh. If both are breathing, but through the day, if you are breathing continuously through both, that means you are a yogi, perfectly balanced. So then the energy can move up the shushumna. Uh, or me, so if I find, say just now, my right is more breathing Active. more, how do I balance it other than do it, going into no, So close your right nostril and breathe from your left for some time. It will balance. That, that activates it, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or uh, use Nasivion. I do that. Or use what? Nasivion or Otto. <laughs> Good one. Use the yogic technique, right? So when you are feeling stressed and hyper, okay, close your right, breathe through your left. It will calm you down. And if you are wanting not to sleep, you are going on, you are driving for a long time, you don't want to zone off at the wheel, please breathe, close your left, breathe from your right and activate the Pingala Nadi. And when you are physically ill, my, the means cold and cough, automatically. Then so both are blocked. So, <laughs> so if you are stressed out, and you need to calm down. Start breathing from the left. If you need to be very active in the world and to be very sharp and on point at a meeting or something, then breathe from the right. So. So the, here Swamiji says that this kind of, he's explaining actually the Hongso method of meditation. And he says this is not part of the Kriya, Kriya breath or Kriya yoga, but it is a very good starting point, which is where we start. And uh, Yogananda used to call it the baby Kriya. We are preparing our minds and bodies to accept the final initiation. And that itself is a nine-month process. So we are going step by step slowly till we initiate people in the actual Kriya breath. So next sloka is, he finds peace who knows me as the enjoyer of all offerings or yagyas and austerities, as the infinite Lord of creation, as the dearest friend of all. So basically, what is uh, Krishna telling Arjuna that you will only be at peace when you know that you are not the doer. It is God who is the doer, who is acting through you. Once you actually understand that and internalize that, then you will be at peace. So he finds peace who knows me, like Krishna is talking about himself, me as the enjoyer of all offerings and austerities, as the infinite Lord of creation and the dearest friend of all. So Swamiji says, man usually thinks of himself as enjoying personally whatever blessings he receives from spiritual practices. It is in fact God's bliss enjoying itself. We love with his love. We enjoy with his joy. So it is said right in the Gita that the God created the universe to be able to enjoy himself through his creations. So we have to realize that the energy of God is in all of his creations, including us. So when we are doing something or when we are enjoying something, it is actually God enjoying himself. Thus ends the fifth chapter called Freedom Through Inner Renunciation of the Upanishad of the Holy Bhagavad Gita in the dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna discussing yoga and the science of God realization. So, 
we go to the next chapter it is called the true yoga for me can i make a request yeah. since we anyway take that 5 to 10 minute break yeah why don't we take it now so that we start at 7 that we have a longer time for meditation also okay so basically i don't know I, if it's works it for is, everyone uh, oh no but everyone doesn't go on into the meditation oh, huh? okay okay sorry then yeah. that doesn't work yeah. so that is not good right so i go on to the next chapter the true yoga the blessed lord said the true renunciate and the true yogi are those who perform dutiful actions without desire for their fruits and not those who making no self offering act with ego motivation nor those who in the name of renunciation abstain from action so here we are back to the eternal theme of the gita to act or not to act and if we act what is right action that is actually the whole thing of the gita all the time coming back to it so krishna says the true renunciate who is a true renunciate or a true yogi are people who perform dutiful actions dutiful action is dharmic action what is dharmic action and dutiful action it is any action which will move us towards god any action which moves us away from god is karma any action which moves us towards god is dharmic action dharma or dutiful action okay so understanding of duty is not what we understand as duty our duty to ourselves as souls on the spiritual journey is to do everything that will move us towards source that is dutiful action okay now those dutiful actions we must perform without desire for the fruits of action so it is not transactional we simply offer ourselves to god and move not because okay if i do this i will get this so we have to do nishkam karma without desire of return whatever comes let it come of itself but we are if we have a transactional mindset when doing spiritual practices oh if i do this then you know i i will become rich or oh, if i do this all my troubles will vanish no we have to do spiritual practices purely for the love of the divine purely to reach that in us which is connected to source so those who perform dutiful actions without desire for their fruits not those who making no self offering some people don't don't bother they 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 don't offer themselves in love and devotion to any supreme power or being they think this is the one life we have and this is the one body and all i need to do is to look after myself and my own so they don't offer themselves to a higher reality they have a contracted consciousness so not those who making no self offering act with ego motivation what is ego motivation what is it what's in it for me the main difference between ego motivation and a someone who acts without desire for uh, the returns without looking to the returns the essential difference in a yogi is what's in it for me versus how can i serve you when we are moving towards becoming more and more like our higher selves we will naturally come from a position of service what is true leadership true leadership is to be in service not someone who's the big boss saying you do this and you do this true leadership is how can i help you to grow how can i serve you so a yogi just that flip in attitude is going to shift a lot in ourselves 
what's in it for me versus how may I serve you? And when you think like this, your whole energy shifts, your whole being shifts, and your relationship with the world and other people also shift. Because you may not tell them, how may I serve you? But your attitude is of service. How may I benefit you rather than, you know, what's in it for me? What will I get out of this interaction? Okay. So making no self-offering act with ego motivation, nor those who in the name of renunciation abstain from action. So Swamiji later says, there are many people, you know, who come on the spiritual path actually because they are lazy. They think that if I go into a monastery or something, I will get my three square meals or two square meals. I just have to sit quietly. I don't have to take responsibility for wife and kids and job and bosses and all. Let me just retire into a monastery and say I am spiritual. So that is not going to take you anywhere, right? It will actually give you a lot of karma. In fact, there are a lot of people like this on the spiritual path who have just said, uh, you know, I am leaving home. Basically, they can't handle it anymore. I am going to a monastery. Gone. So that's a nice way to escape your responsibility. Much of what Krishna says here, he has said before. Here, however, his message is broader. He is re-emphasizing that the essence of the spiritual life is ego transcendence whether one lives in the world in a monastery or solitarily in a cave. So just because you have declared yourself a monk and you are in orange robes is no guarantee of spiritual growth. So you can have equal spiritual growth, whether you are in a household, living your day-to-day -day life, having kids, taking the responsibility, or if you were sitting in a cave and meditating, or if you just entered a monastery and became part of some uh, spiritual order. So the goal is ego transcendence, wherever you may be. So it is a mistake to, you know, householders often, the moment they will see a saffron clad sadhu, they automatically presume that the sadhu is much more evolved than them. But that is often not so. So some amount of discrimination is required and it is equally possible to be a householder and move very rapidly on the spiritual path. So I think actually it is going to go into more uh, deep explanations of this. So there's three minutes left. I will stop here. Okay. And we will meet next Sunday. Let's end with a prayer and we will send out the healing vibrations. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing power in all bodies, minds and souls. Let's rub our hands together, send out the healing vibration. Please chant Om loudly with me three times. Oh Om. Om. Shanti Shanti So thank you everyone see you next Sunday and Kriya Bans, please remain. Thank you.